Um, so when people are keep joining in, I just want to uh, quickly introduce uh, the speakers of today. And um, of course, I already tried to apologize uh, for those uh, technical <laughs> issues that we are having on, on, on LinkedIn Live. It doesn't seem to be a very much of a reliable platform in a sense. So we have uh, Levent Sab Sabados. Uh, um, he is actually the lecturer at Frankfurt School, and he's actually one of the main person professor that uh, taught my whole class about AI. And actually, he's the magic visa visa in here uh, that taught a lot of people without a technical background and coding experience of what is AI. And that's why today we, we invited him uh, to talk about generative AI and ChatGPT. We also have um, Dennis um, Lotra in here. He's actually my classmate at the Frankfurt School, and we are both doing the master of data analytic and management and he's a consultant in the space so for those of you that already know me i'm christian jaws i'm a linton creators and um, i'm also a master student in the frankfurt school um thank you so much for joining and lev i would like to uh leave the floor for you and please um so uh, before we start uh, maybe it's better that i do a housekeeping so um, for the first 10, 15 minutes, we will have left um, to do a bit of demonstration to show us, you know, what is ChatGPT and show us some of the example we have done. Um, because during the conversation that we have so far, we realize uh, there are lots of misconceptions with ChatGPT. It's not just uh, a magic box that you throw in the question and you got an answer immediately. Um, so we think it's actually important to do a live demonstrations on, well, not live, but a demonstration on a live streaming event um, on ChatGPT. And, and, and then after uh, this, 10 15 minutes uh, demonstrations we uh, me Dennis and left we will go into a live de uh, discussion uh, talk about some of the key points and 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 look some of the critical topics about chat GPT so left um I will leave you the floor thank you very much so I mean what is the, the question is always this what is because with AI this is always a recurring question of wow magic so my my task here is and always as in Frankfurt School is somehow to take away the magic. So I'm 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 absolutely not the magician. I'm the anti-magician, so to say, because I'm always <laughs> going there and trying to convince people that uh, sophisticated technology, which looks like magic, is actually not. Uh, so I think what I wanted to kind of cover a little bit is is how this. Uh, sudden appearance of ChatGPT as a phenomena is related to other things because everyone has a perception that that coming up with ChatGPT was something radically new and has nothing to do with previous things that we had as technology. My argument will be that it's completely not the case. Uh, a level of sophistication up for sure, but it's very strongly connected to things that we were already doing. And now come the Next step is that I need screen sharing. So I will I would need Christiana to give me the right to share my screen. Without it, it's also okay, but maybe it's more entertaining if I show something. No, maybe. Or just make me also a host and then we can be super happy about it. Now, up until we figured that out. Oh, you oh, are. Yeah. Yeah, oh, you yeah, are yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, can share right. for sure. Right. Nice. Okay, perfect. cool. Very cool. Very cool already. So, I mean, the big question is, is that in, in artificial intelligence, we are chasing after a, a certain very elusive thing. And, and I always uh, try to kind of frustrate even my poor students at Frankfurt School about if they are able to define intelligence, what natural intelligence is, then I'm very happy to define what artificial intelligence is. Mm -hmm. So the big question is like, what is this complex phenomenon of intelligence, how we can decompose into parts? And one of the, the very good arguments is that one of the ways to capture a part of intelligence, not the totality of it, is to be able to capture the usage of language. So using some tool, some computerized tool, some modeling tool, specifically in our case, some statistically motivated tool to capture what language means is a pretty nice way to capture one part of what, we, what makes us intelligent. Uh, that's a traditional way to put things. So it's uh, up from the 1950s, this was a research agenda. Uh, and what changed is that the way, the, the how we capture uh, the meaning of language, and I would like to talk a bit about the stages that we went through. 
naively, I think every one of you already saw word clouds. I mean, uh, if, if you want to describe like what is a, a, an article about, one of the easiest way to imagine is like you take the most frequently occurring words uh, in that article. And that the word cloud is nothing else by that. You just basically count how many times a certain element is there in a text. And basically, in, in a very rough argument, one would one could say that if you count enough, if you have a, a, a big enough uh, mapping or, or co-occurrence count of this co-occurs with that, then you understand some relationship between words. That's so far pretty nice, but but there is a, a more sophisticated way to, to try to uncover these relationships, which are a bit more difficult than, than just the counting relationships. Namely, I think if you look at a sentence, you already realize that that sentence has some kind of structure. So you are only able to finish my sentence. Observe that you didn't say finish my homework, finish my meal, because you already knew the context. There was a context. And from the context, you could very much predict of what is the next step, next word I will be using. Exactly that is what we are training computers to do. Uh, what is basically a language model? We are talking about large language models. A language model is nothing else but some kind of machinery that is able to continue a sentence. Basically predict what comes next. It is very, very good at it. And whilst it gets good at it, it necessarily has to figure out relationships between meanings. So if you are able to do this prediction, the students open there, and maybe there are more and less probable continuation. It's more probable that people open their books or laptops. One could open the hearts of students, but, which is very touching, but maybe not the most probable solution for this, this sentence. So whilst you are figuring out this predictive relationship, this modeling relationship, you're necessarily discovering relationships between meanings of words. You will be able to, you, you may basically must. So a model must figure out that there is a relationship between man and woman, which is somehow the same relationship that, that is there between king and queen. In the sense of there is this gender relationship, which I never explicitly taught to a machine, just it had to figure it out because it was, it was processing text on a large scale. And basically that is it. A large language model is, is, a, is a parrot. A parrot is just, you know, you sell a sentence and the parrot is just repeating it. You tell a sentence and the parrot is repeating it. The only thing that this parrot is connected to the internet in the sense of you took like a, a couple of billion words from the internet and you teach, taught it to a parrot. And now it's very happily parroting back the internet. Uh, now, this is very positive in a sense, and this is very limited in a sense. So think about it. Do we necessarily think that a parrot really understands uh, when it answers to this question? Not really. Maybe it's just a kind of way of singing. The parrot is just singing back to you your favorite song, in a sense. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the parrot is very good at doing mathematics or doing reasoning or doing these kind of things. But it happens to be that this is a funny parrot, since this funny parrot consumed so much of human knowledge that for nearly every uh, association, it can come up with a nice song to sing to you. That's, that's the, the, the main association here. Now, the question is, why is this useful? Because, okay, as a general gimmick, whether it's, it's impressive, good. We can believe it that it's impressive. The question is, how is it useful? And the how is it useful is coming from a certain scale. So what we understood as we, we went on and, and look at the time scale, so this whole way of modeling uh, language has a very long past, but the recent past is interesting, since what we see here is that this way, that the size of the models, so basically the size of the brain of the parrot, got exponentially bigger. So it's, it's not a linear scale, it's a logarithmic scale. It's like 10 times bigger, and even again 10 times bigger, and even again 10 times bigger. 
So if you make the, the brain of the parrot big enough, then it basically can memorize so much of general knowledge. General meaning, what does it mean to be in this context, be in that context, solve this problem, solve that problem, that you end up with an interesting tool that is pretty general purpose. So whilst it is only just continuing your sentences, it solves so many sentences around. It solves so many contexts that is pretty good uh, at solving problems in context when you give it a new context. So that's the that's the spirit here. And yes, I mean, I have to say that this is a pretty uh, interesting uh, development of GPT, which is one of the ways to build a parrot. It's a generative pre-trained transformer, that's GPT. Uh, and certain versions of GPT came pretty rapidly. Like, look at it, it's 100 million, 1.5 billion, 100 billion, and so on. So the brain size is exploding. The other thing that happened is if you look at this rough timeline, is after a while, the size doesn't get too much bigger. Something else happens. Instruct happens. Instruct is something that we figured out that it's not just e as easy to give the parrot things to memorize. Maybe after it memorized a lot of things, we should give some explicit instructions of what behavior we are liking and what behavior we are not liking. For example, we very much like if it continues a sentence with regard to how we previously talked about something. So you know the classical chatbot thing, hi, I am Bob, hi, Bob, conversation goes on, hi, Joe, and it just completely forgot that I, I called myself Bob. That's not a behavior we like. We would like to emphasize that it should be coherent in what it's doing. It should kind of point back to a previous utterance. And so on, so chat GPT, and that's the chat part in it, was fine-tuned to behave, not just be a very good parrot in general, but behave particularly in a way as we would want to have an agent that discusses with us. There are some pre-assumptions which are over and beyond a good good parrot or a good good machine that produces language. We want certain properties of dialogue-based uh, coherence. And that's what ChatGPT is. Basically, it's a fine-tuned form of a general uh, language model. ChatGPT is not unique. So the, the question is here is that, is ChatGPT a unique technology? No. Is it even the biggest? No. ChatGPT is based on GPT-3. It's that this kind of thing, this red, red thing here in the left. And there are a lot of other models uh, by a lot of other companies or open source projects. So when we are talking about language models, we have to bear in mind that ChatGPT is just one of many language models. It happens to be that it's a very successful one. So, okay, what the heck? What is it? What is it good for? I mean, well, let me let me give you some uh, not too good examples, but some that I came up with. Okay. Uh, by the way, these are tasks that generally, classically, were for separate machine learning tasks. So that we we wanted to have different models for all these tasks that I will be showing you. The interesting thing is that now we have one model that can so serve these. Okay. Extracting information. I think every one of you had some, some uh, problems. Uh, I, I just borrowed these demonstrations from my good friend, Dula. Uh, and he has this problem that there are people who are always writing the addresses in different order. First the zip code, then the city, then the street. Or first the, the street, then the city, then the zip code. This thing, that thing, whatever. It, it's a complete chaos. Uh, easy as hell is that uh, one could ask a very helpful assistant uh, to extract every uh, zip code that is a four-digit num numeric value from this text. And well, lo and behold, these are the three zip codes in here. Naturally enough, you can imagine way more complicated problems is that there is a, a, a long text with, a, with a, a financial report from a company, and you would like to extract all the relevant uh, financial metrics out of that. And you wouldn't want to just literally manually go over the whole thing. Just you would say, like, please, from this text, extract me all the relevant, like, uh, 
information pieces. So information extraction or finding things is one of the use cases that is pretty obvious. The other is some kind of classification. Uh, and, and like, what is semantic classification? So semantic classification is a classification which is not uh, looking at the, the characters of the word, but the meaning of the word. What, what do I mean by this? I mean, if you want to, to ask a model of, there are two categories or three categories of clothes, shoes, uh, so clothes, shoes, and other. And I give you this list and please categorize this list into coats, clothes, shoes, and others. And it, it's basically based on the meaning, based on the association of words, please categorize things into different categories of meaning. Now, why would this be interesting? Uh, let me give you an example. There are patient inquiries that are coming in uh, to, to an email hotline of a, of a health institution that we have some connection with, and they wanted to categorize of what kind of patient inquiry it is. It's kind of a, a, this type of for, for that department, that type for that department. It's very easy to ask basically ChatGPT, look, here is the email, where should I send it? And that's, that's basically one of the simple ways or to, to be more specific with sentiment. Uh, you have all the, the feeds, for example, uh, in, in our LinkedIn feed, now people are not that happy. So maybe the sentiment uh, uh, com of comments underneath our feed is like, whoa, these people cannot even do LinkedIn Live. Uh, interesting social listening exercise uh, for for companies would be to to literally mine the comments under under the feeds of the the certain advertisements or certain company utterances and it's super easy to just literally type in and ask uh, chat gpt about uh, about these things to be be classified into categories uh summarization it's like, uh, as the joke says, and as you, are, my friend, always jokes, it's like we are not having the, we are we are too busy to write it short, in the sense. So we have a lot of information. He's a very big Metallica fan, so he just uh, tried to summarize one of Metallica's songs into, uh, into some kind of uh, a pretty nice summary. The lyrics of the song suggest you to be cautious and vigilant, and so on and so on. So I mean, summarization as for human consumption. So you want to, to take a big amount of information and, and compress it to some bullet points, say a meeting minutes. So there is a transcript of a meeting. Uh, some colleagues use it as this. For every meeting, there is a meeting recording. The recording goes into a, a trans transcription service. The transcript comes back. And then you ask GPT to summarize it to nice bullet points and you can send around the bullet points in, in, in an email. And that's, that's, I think, a pretty useful thing. And I mean, the other way around, it's not just when summarizing, but like extracting or, or giving more generative uh, meaning to things. Interesting is how strongly context is, uh, is in there in the sense of look at it. The input was paradise, Adam, Eve, Apple, snake, outcast which already gives a context to the, the model. And this context was very nicely used. I mean, in the sense of the model can make up kind of nice chunks of text, which are coherent in that given context. Uh, I mean, look for a single sentence. Yeah, maybe this is a gimmick. Uh, for another case, like one of our colleagues uh, has a small daughter. And uh, he was really out of new ideas because the, his daughter is always asking for new and new stories, like bedtime stories. So what he could do is that he said like, okay, man, I, I'm out of bedtime stories. So the thing is that you will act as a storyteller, you will write a short story of an artist who's a genius, but completely misunderstood and so on. And there's your bedtime story. I mean, I can naturally understand that if this is not a bedtime story, but a product description that you might want to put out to your website, uh, it is equally an interesting thing to write. And you put in the product pro properties and ask GPT to write a nice product description. Uh, and I mean, finally, just to reflect on why these models are called generative models, uh, they're generative models in the sense of they, that, that's, 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 that's the point. They are able to generate new unseen uh, ways or unseen stories, unseen things, because they are just predicting a, a logical continuation 
of the, the, the storyline or the context. And I mean, as a final gimmick, my friend was, uh, was saying that, okay, but what if I want some illustrations for the bedtime story? He went over to another generative model, which is a parallel development uh, like Midjourney or Dali or, or Stable Diffusion, uh, which is a visual generative model. And sure enough, a man telling a story to the grandsons. Yeah, sure. So you see the, the illustration in the storybook illustration style. Uh, so this is how, how kind of uh, de novo things could be uh, generated. Now, what I wanted to show you, and this is like live chat GPT, if you want, I can show it again. Uh, so there is an interesting thing. Who is the current president of the USA? Now, the interesting thing is that my naive expectation would be that it knows who the current president of the USA is. When uh, ChatGPT was first deployed, what happened is that it completely obviously told you that it was Barack Obama because it was the previous model was trained when it was Barack Obama and it just completely obviously thought that it's Barack Obama. And, they, and interestingly enough, now OpenAI had to engineer a, a new like extra add-on to the model, see what happens. As an AI language model, my knowledge is up to date only up to September 2021, and I cannot provide real-time information. As of uh, my last update, Joe Biden was the president of the United States, and so on. So what happened here is that basically this is a, this is a frozen model of, of a certain point of the internet. The model itself currently as in this, this modality, doesn't have up-to-date information. And it's already a very good thing that people had manually engineered into it the ability to reflect on what it doesn't know. Because naturally, the original way would be to very confidently say that it's Barack Obama. So the, the interesting thing is now how you live with the technology, which is very convincing, very confident, and sometimes very wrong. How you live with it is twofold. One way to do it is like exactly that, that someone who operates the technology is manually putting in extra effort to, oh, 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 please, please, please. It's no longer, don't be so confident. It's not Obama. You are just a language model and so on and so on. So that's one way to put it. And the other way to put it, I, I still, I'm waiting for the wait list because there is a thing called plugins. Uh, that are that are kind of currently deployed, and I'm sadly not on the short list, so I cannot show you the plugins. But plugins would be able to connect things to real time search to external APIs. If you go over to Bing, the Bing search is already doing it. Like the context in which a language model is operated is coming from real time search, and then the model is talking to you about the answers which is a way to ground the models to reality. Now, reality, you know, the thing was trained on the internet. The search is coming from the internet. And as we all know, the internet is always right, isn't that? It's the final source of truth for everything, isn't that? I think that's one of the big challenges that we will have to live with. Thank you so much, Lev. Um, oh, good news. It's now it's finally live. So, oh, cool. <laughs> so we will, Linda, yeah. are able to see your demonstration. I mean, 80, 90% cool. of the demonstration, which is a very good news. Um, and now we approximate uh, combining from Linton's and from uh, uh, Zoom, we have approximately 40, 50 people joining, which is a super good sign. Um, and, and let me quickly introduce uh, our speaker again, because many of them, they have missed out the first session. And you can imagine that I'm actually speaking very fast to try to catch up with the time. Um, we have Levent uh, um, um, Sabados. He's actually the lecturer at Frankfurt School. He's actually also the lead consultant at Neuron Solutions. Um, he's our, uh, one of our first professors that actually lead many of our master students at the business school to know about AI, even they don't really have a technical background or knowledge about coding. But uh, we knew within a week, he taught us how to create our own AI model. Uh, that's why we, we think it's actually our 
great privilege to have him in here to discuss about um, the, the key topic about ChatGTP since it's a, such a to popular topic to actually keep people awake at the evening. We also have Dennis Lodger, he's a consultant and he's also a master's student at Frankfurt School and we are both studying the Master of Data Analytics and Management program. Um, thank you everyone for joining, even though we have this 10 minute delay, you guys do wait for us. And now let's uh, just quickly move uh, to the discussions uh, sessions. So uh, left based on the, uh, the whole demonstration you showed, there's actually one key uh, question that come out in my mind. It's about the relationship between the pumped and the result. Um, and of course, that's also a key starting question uh, for those who have already used ChatGDP and haven't used it before. And one of the most common uh, misconceptions about ChatGDP, it's it's not some many, many of people claim that it's not providing meaningful output. Uh, for example, some of the professional professors that I know from the top university, because they are being worried that ChatGDP with the best cheating tool for their kid, for their mm -hmm. students. Yeah. So they put in uh, the, the the research questions or the exam question into ChatGPT and see what results they would get. And then they are quite disappointed. But I, I think it's important for us to all to address the fact that, you know, uh, the pumps there is not just the key to open the door. It's a process that you continue to monitor and engage with the ChatGDP. It's like teaching your kids how to walk. So what do both of you uh, think about the relationship between the pumps and the final result of ChatGDP? Uh, it's absolutely crucial. So as you say, the way you ask a question, the way you formulate the question, uh, it, it's crucial. In the sense, imagine this model as being the best improvisation theater player ever. And I mean, there are two rules of the improvisation theater. One is never break the, the, the role. So you always, always keep with the role and never think twice, just say what you want to say. So it's basically just an artist in the sense of it just very confidently says the first thing that it comes into its mind. The, the real magic in prompting and prompt engineering became kind of a professional topic in the sense of, of people spending time to figuring out how to structure the question so that you get the de desired result. My, I mean, uh, we, we also hold some lectures in that, which are, I mean, there is even a company who set up a, a pretty nice uh, uh, kind of material of learning material about how to do prompting. But I think as a one sentence summary, the interesting point in this is like it's a process. Mm -hmm. It's not that you put in the thing and you expect the final result. It's never so. Remember that these models were trained to interact with someone. So you're basically, the more you can interactively refine what you're looking for, make it longer, make it shorter, submit, like, like omit these parts, put in those parts. As much as you work on the text of how to ask, as much the model can help you with, with giving certain outputs and, and leading your, your mind of, okay, maybe I would try this way, maybe I would try that way. So it's always think of it as an interactive tool. Yeah. Uh, I would definitely agree with that. I think prompt engineering plays a vital role in how leverage um, language models such as ChatGPT and how to leverage its performance correctly. I mean, you can give context, you can give structure, you can design tasks, you can reword things as Lev just mentioned in the form of a theater performance and then reword that based upon the output you get. So as much effort as you put in, that is sort of what you will get out, but don't expect it in just a few steps or in one step, but in the long run sort of reiterate of what you got out and um, yeah, and have this kind of structure in, in which way you pop chat GPT. For sure, for sure. Um, we we are already seeing people releasing papers yeah. and documents on the, the pump, the set of pumps that you get. So like using one example, it's mid journey. You know, using yeah. specific descriptions or or, or nerve terms, terms or or vocabulary that you would get specifically uh, uh, results or even outstanding, uh, 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 you know, uh, outstanding results. But does that mean um, it's we can develop a dictionary of pumps and people can actually use this dictionary of pumps to generate the best results and the best performance of judging? GDP, is that correct? Well, I mean, not just a dictionary. There are things which are called prompt marketplaces. 
I mean, literally they exist. Is that like, this is the nicest formulation I came up with for writing this kind of thing. And when it's a very witty advertisement text, then this was my formulation or that was my formulation. So yeah, this is becoming a kind of cottage industry in the mm -hmm. sense of, of, of prompting. But I think the, the most important thing is that there is no such thing as professional prompters versus non-professional. Whoever has the attitude of being interactive and reflective enough can get pretty good results. But it's it's a patience game. You have to try. That's a very um, nice and, and warm word because I, we are seeing there are so many new role coming up called with the names of like Pum Engineer, you know, or, or Chef uh, ChatGVT and head of ChatGVT of some company, but in fact, it's it's not. There's no. I mean, there's gateway, but there's no obvious gateway mm -hmm. out there preventing people from using this technology. But of course, we will quickly touch base on this very soon. And 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 both of you have mentioned the process of continue continually uh, monitor. You know, ChatGDP. Um, there's actually another one very interesting question and debate that come out. It's about the consciousness of ChatGDP. <laughs> so on one side, it's very simple for me to just throw a question to you asking um, whether ChatGDP has consciousness. But I also took a few days to think about it and I realized it's a much more complicated question than just a yes or no answer. What do you guys think about it first? I mean, there are layers of the answer for sure. Uh, the obvious answer is that in, in any traditional way, it is not. And that's why I wanted to put it uh, akin to a parrot because a parrot is not necessarily knowing what it speaks. So there is no expectation for us to, to look at the parrot and think that it really reflects on the things and it really gives back this answer. Wow. No, it's just parroting back stuff. But this is this is kind of a half answer. If I really want to go with go with what, what Christian uh, asked is like a bit more deeper, I would suggest that it's not a conscious, but it's a subconscious. So in the sense of all the associations, you know, these games when psychologists in even in the 30s and 40s made people play these games of association. If mm -hmm. I tell you this word, then what, what word you say? Mm -hmm. And this association game tells a lot about your subconscious uh, activities. And I think exactly this association game is going on. So basically, ChatGPT can be understood as the language unconsciousness of like the internet's unconscious or subconscious <laughs> or, or this, this kind of Freudian, Freudian <laughs> oh. view on the internet, so to say. Which is, I mean, sometimes you have to like, you know, uh, even Freud had some problems when, he, when you look <laughs> into the <laughs> unconscious mind deep enough, pretty yeah. nasty things can be in there. Uh, as with the internet, if you look deep enough, there are pretty nasty things in there. So there is not a bad analogy, I have to say. So so you would say Freud is... Uh, he was they ChatGPT is like the id in Freud. <laughs> yes, yes, so it absolutely. Be, it mean, just tells I mean, you. It just literally yeah. tells you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it it does have an. I mean, there are some filter elements in there, but I completely agree. Sometimes when you prompt, you get sort of the answer out right away, and it gives you sort of this no holds barred view of what you just asked. And if you don't restrict sort of any context, then you say, okay, this is a very surprising answer. But to answer your question, Cristiano, from uh, from my perspective, this this is a very long question to answer because you can ask yourself, of course, what is consciousness? And there's, of course, research, what has been done. Um, I wouldn't have thought to mention Kurt Gödel right now, but incomplete uh, his incomplete theorem of having systems prove that they can be complete or non-complete is, for example, one of those that that limits the development of of um, a sort of general artificial intelligence, but as um, I think I said it before, it is a step, a very big step forward in what we've seen so far on the basis of a language model. Mm -hmm. And that I think already, having been at this uh, step now, it might have not been a surprise from GPT-3 to 3.5 to, to 4, but this is a relatively short time frame for as much as the theory already exists. So I think this is re remarkable in terms of the time frame, but of course the technology and the theory has been around for a lot longer. 
Because taking a step back, when it comes to the definition of uh, consciousness, it's it have it have something to do with you know self self awareness, self consciousness, yeah. or whether uh, this AI model, this person's or uh, this creatures is able to give direct response uh, or have a feelings mm -hmm. on things. That this might be a very rough description and thoughts about consciousness. Um, but I, I I always believe ChatGPT is just more like a language model. And the reason why people believe ChatGPT have consciousness and able to replace human is because it's able to transcribe into a human understandable language that actually scares and surprises a lot of people. But then uh, this question come back to my mind because two days ago I saw Stanford that's actually uh, collaborated with uh, Google and it created uh, a simulation video uh, games with uh, twenty or twenty five characters in there <laughs> and. <laughs> It's, it's nodding and then those 25 characters uh, behind them is the chat gdp and then they are you provide them with um with, with with like some characteristics and then they have the ability to memorize what's happening in this game which is i think a very important thing before developing uh consciousness for for an ai um and that started to confuse me because it, it, it shows they're able to spontaneously do a uh, lots of things in the past let's say 20 days in the game they're able to host party people are able to respond um mm -hmm. given their characteristics and given their uh specialty but does that confuse me you know, for the wrong reasons, or is it the ever is it possible that ChatGPT become a key component of another AI algorithm that can enable consciousness of another AI algorithm or characters in a in, in a game? What do you guys think about it? Yeah, I mean, since uh, uh, since I'm a Buddhist, I'm very much enjoying that you are you are kind of uh, in trouble. <laughs> and not because I'm a sadist. So no, 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 no. I think like chasing consciousness and asking the question of what is consciousness is the question that that is. I mean, for from my me as a Buddhist, like this is the question that one has to ask. So this is like, uh, if I would quote a, a nice Zen master, yeah, that's the point. What? That's the point. What? So the more confused you are, the better, in a sense. No, I mean, joke aside. Uh, just if you want to be more concrete, is that what we understood is that the mental activity that is going on in our head is decomposable to certain subtasks. Mm -hmm. So much of what we do can be decomposed. And one of the, one big chunk we now successfully captured with this, I would say, linguistic subconscious activity. The interesting is that this is not in itself a thing. Remember that for like being factual or being able to act on anything out, out of the box, it already requires connections to other systems, like a search engine, like a knowledge base, like a, an external database of facts, a reasoning engine, and so on. So currently, I think the most up-to-date view on these things is that if we ever want to construct more and more complicated machines of artificial intelligence, forget about consciousness, but just agents that are more and more useful, most possibly what we will find is that there are, we, we have to Lego it together from different systems. And the interesting point that happened is that the glue that, that sticks these together happens to be something like language. Hmm. Uh, much of what we do in programming is based on human language because programming languages were created for humans. What we communicate with amongst each other is based on language because that's just what we do and so on. So simulating much of the activities of what we do and consider useful in an economic sense can be somehow glued together with some systems talking to each other or talking to us. And I think the important paradigm of this, this, this like generative language thing is that enables systems to talk. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's pretty powerful and more powerful than one could imagine in the sense of yesterday, I held a demonstration for my own colleagues that I, I could successfully prompt uh, ChatGPT together with some external memory to, to start to program some stuff instead of me. So I was able to put it into a nice, nice way of usage that there was an external system. And I just gave a, a website that described that system and it's kind of generated code based on that and started to talk to the system and so on and so on. So it's basically a, an automation tool via language to computer systems, which is pretty powerful.
That does this I, refer to um sorry that this is referred to the auto GPT chat G, auto GPT yes, which is something <laughs> like that something like that it's uh, I had my own experience or, or experiments with that but yeah yeah it's very much alike very much alike and just based on that I think that's where sort of the subdivision of human task language in between tasks whatever that human task may be sort of the communication mechanism and now that we're at the stage. Uh, where um, a language model such as ChatGPT can communicate at that stage and not minimize but alleviate some human tasks such as development and in the future, of course, people get better and there's other solutions that we've seen as well. And I think this can be extremely valuable and we shouldn't have the expectation of expecting one giant system to take everything away that a human does, but sort of have this view of subdomain that develop over time. And and followed by this uh, discussion of consciousness, this another um, phenomenon that we observe so f well after you know ChatGPT launched uh, for quite a while, it's the fear and resistance of ChatGPT. I mean, we this is a very common topic that we discuss when we try to talk about AI, um, and it's a critical aspect to consider when we try to implement uh, generative AI or AI or technology or digitalizations in the corporate levels. So, um, and, and followed by that, um, there are quite a few argument discussion in regards to the ownership and the responsibility well, of the output of chat GDP. What, what do you, what do you, I mean, this is a very common question. This is, this happened for many, many years. It's not just happened for chat GDP, but in general, what do you guys think about um, um, this? Well, I mean, responsibility, as as we know it, is is always pertaining to humans. So as long as we don't convince ourselves uh, that some system is as equivalent to us that it has rights, then if as long as it doesn't have rights, it doesn't have responsibilities. So that, that just just doesn't work. <laughs> so in this sense, it has to be somewhat somewhat fair and somewhat equal. So uh, I mean, under current circumstances, responsibility is always human. Uh, now, refining on that, uh, it's pretty similar to to nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is, is like, let us be honest, it's a pretty deadly and pretty dangerous way of doing technology. Nuclear technology is always very dangerous. But nonetheless, in certain cases, it's extremely useful. And we kind of the, collectively develop some ways to live with it and live with it productively in the sense of there are, there are these ways of behavior that enable it to be super safe under circumstances, which is like, a, that's, that's an interesting thing that, that whenever a new technology comes in, we always think of that when that it's, it's in a raw form, uh, it's always understandable. My favorite example is that, you know, the shopping carts in companies, in, in, in grocery stores. Whenever the guy who came up with this idea and patented it and created the first thing, he put it into grocery stores and people literally didn't know what to do with it. And he had to hire actors that were pushing that cart back and forth and showing that, look, you can put your groceries into the grocery cart. And until people kind of accustomed to or, or kind of came up with the right behavioral attitude to a shopping cart, people were not using shopping carts. So this is the same with any technology, especially with a technology which is pretty quickly developing and pretty radical in, in the scope. So I think what's going on here is that somehow, uh, first and foremost, I encourage you to be the person who pushes the shopping cart first, because I, A, it's very useful, B, it's super fun. But nonetheless, I think the takeaway here is that, that uh, it's an adaptation procedure. The big question is, can we speed up the adaptation procedure of people to be as quick as the new technologies come out? And I think the key here is also to have this element of exposure. I mean, there's lots of people who have already had exposure to chat GPT as a tool, but there's of course people who haven't had exposure at all and don't even know how to get a proper access. I think in the beginning, and what left this is the example also you mentioned with the shopping cart, which I find very interesting, is this fear of the unknown. That first, when you have a new technology, you're not quite sure how to use it, uh, what it does, and what it can do for you. And I think in this case of 
ChatGPT is that once people get around to using it and realizing the benefit for themselves that this might have, then over time they become used to changes within the system or further development. But of course, this only comes with repeated exposure. Indeed. For sure, and and follow followed by this um, implement, implementation process uh, and this uh, common fear and resistance about uh, AI technology, um, it, it it of course uh, bring up concern on um, digital divide, um, on, on inequalities in a society. It also bring in new um, challenge or, or, or new, actually I think it's a new opportunity for people to actually actually think about our current education system and how are we going to adopt a new way and learn new technology and new new knowledge as an individual so as a takeaway what do you guys think about it like how can we really adopt into the current uh dynamic and flow um is our old education systems no longer valid or we need to find a new way to dive through what what do you guys think about it yeah well i mean uh, i have very strong opinions on that since i'm teaching in the, in the current education system you know so uh, that means i i for example as a policy i'm very strongly pushing towards not just uh, tolerating chatgpt as a tool for example but maybe actively encouraging people to use chatgpt as a tool even for exams in certain cases or or some submissions of stuff uh, an interesting thing happens is that if you look back to to uh, the history of how education changed, people were completely shocked about uh, calculators, pocket calculators. It's just that mathematical knowledge will go away with pocket calculators. That was always a problem. And like uh, even before that, like with, with, with printing press, people are not memorizing a lot of stuff and so on. So interestingly, that the, the balance current always shifts towards more and more mechanical parts of what has to be learned, remembered, executed are, are pushed out to, to certain devices. There is a mechanical device doing the calculation. There is a mechanical device that gives you the information. The interesting thing is that what do you really want to achieve or what is the strategy to achieve it? and how you reflect on where you are and are you moving to the right part, this is more and more becoming important. So the, the, the funny thing is that it forces you to become more reflective and not less reflective, interestingly enough. That's why I wanted to emphasize that also in the prompt engineering part that it enhances your daily reflectivity in the sense of you're literally forced to think about, oh, did I formulate this question right? Did, did, did I really tell what I wanted to tell? Or I was just automatically writing out stuff without any, any second thoughts? So I think what is very strongly coming up as a, as a goal for education is an extremely strong emphasis on reflection. I agree. I mean, in, in, in part sort of the disliberalization that you, that you speak of can sort of be a, a gateway to help solve problems in circumstances such as coursework and circumstances such as exams and in sort of other learning environments that actually does not, you know, stop thinking, but actually encourages thinking because it exposes people to new viewpoints, to, to, to knowledge, but also to their own refinement of their own capabilities. And I quite remember, even though I was not <laughs> born yet, the sign in 1979 from professors, don't uh, please ban calculators because not everybody will have a calculator um, uh, with us later. And then we had the phone about 40 years later, smartphone. Sure. And I think <laughs> society always adapts and education in that as well as, as, as it is at the forefront, um, always adapts to new technologies. And it's all about utilizing um, technologies correctly rather than sort of deliberalizing their usage. I, I totally agree. I also think chat GDP, I'm actually very optimistic toward the technology. I think it actually mm -hmm. free up people's hands, first of all. Secondly, it, it, it actually emphasizes a lot more on critical thinking because you need to be very conscious with the question you ask, which is a very 
challenging skills for lots of people, to be honest, and also be critical about the answer you receive and about even about yourself. So I, I think a good education system is, is there to enable people to explore themselves, explore about the universe and be critical about, you know, the, 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 the opinions and the values they once held in the past. And, and I do think this technology is able to accelerate this process. Um, I, in fact, there are actually a lot more we can actually discuss about, but um, unfortunately, we have already passed the time. I'm going to leave it out here, but um, I hope um, in the future we are able to host another event, a live streaming event again with no technical issue and challenge. <laughs> um, I do want to apologize to everyone, you know, on LinkedIn and also in Zoom. Um, and I do appreciate to all those uh, participants, like 30, 40 participants staying until the end uh, of this uh, webinar. Um, we will convert this into a podcast. We will upload that into Spotify. We'll upload that into Apple Podcasts and you're able to listen to it again. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you, Left. Thank you, Dennis, for your time joining in. Um, we would like to wish you a very good evening. And that's all for today's sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.